actually a God who is there and powerful and able to intervene in the world and in their lives. And so they fall in love with Jesus. And they start to experience the freedom that comes with that. They start to feel liberated. They start to feel a joy and a, and, and a freedom in life that comes from knowing the God that created you that wants you to kind of live a, a, a free life where you just trust and follow God and don't have to please Him, but has already done the work of setting you right with Him. So Paul leaves... Just like maybe you felt last Sunday, if you're a Packer fan, five minutes left, it's a done deal. Paul, Paul leaves with this, we're going to the Super Bowl optimism. He left feeling, oh my gosh, all, all these people need to do is just keep going. All they need to do is just keep holding to the faith that, that I see alive and well in them. Keep going that direction until Jesus comes back and, and we're golden. He left feeling as good and as optimistic as he possibly could for these people. It's over. It's over. But then a few months later, Paul must have interacted with someone who'd been to Galatia or received a letter from the Galatians themselves. One way or another, Paul got an update on what was happening in, the, in these churches in this region that made him angry and sick. It tore him apart. What had happened was... Um, there was this competing band of preachers that was kind of following Paul around, going where he had been, and, and preaching a different message. And what they would try to do was they were Jewish. Uh, they were also kind of Jesus guys, but they were really trying to get people who had no Jewish background to try to not just be Christian, but to embrace the entirety of the Jewish faith and legal system, which for men included circumcision. Now, men, let me ask you. <laughs> How would that feel? How would that sound if it wasn't just a white connect card that you had to turn in to get involved? <laughs> but I say, follow me to the back room. We have a flint knife, and we're going to take care of a little business. <laughs> they walked around from town to town and says, um, guys, what Paul told you is all good and true about Jesus, but here's the thing. Uh, you must become Jewish or this Jesus is of no good to you. What you need to do is you need to become, men, you need to become circumcised and you need to run your whole society and culture around the Jewish Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And you need to orient your life and culture around he, he, the Hebrew way of looking at the world, even though that is not your culture, that is not your background. And you were introduced to Jesus and fell in love with Jesus in a completely separate mode of living. In other words, Paul says, uh, Paul's... Um, Disciples were told in Galatia, Jesus is not enough for you. And they were, they probably panicked. They, they, oh goodness, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you, I'm glad you told us. I mean, it makes sense that Jesus was a Jew. Okay, so they put it all together and they buy it, hook, line, and sinker. They convinced the Galatian churches to embrace uh, Hebrew law and demand that anybody who comes to Christ has to also fulfill the minutia of the Torah, the, the, the Hebrew uh, legal system, which included circumcision, which for Paul is a big deal. Paul was Jewish. He gets all that, and he also knew that no one has ever perfectly honored the Jewish legal system, so they were setting themselves up for utter failure. And what Paul is most concerned about here is that these people, without even knowing it, were trading the gospel that set them free with another message, with a, an entirely different religion. They were trading Jesus for a ritual. They were trading Jesus kind of for a, a legal system that gave the image of control because you can kind of, you know, have a, a set of rules and rituals in front of you and kind of control it. But they were trading a, a relationship with the living God for a system of controls. And Paul sees this as a very, very dangerous path that makes Christianity no different than any of the other 10,000 religions out there. And so he is absolutely mortified. He writes the letter to the Galatians out of this anger, this sickness, the sense of devastation and desperation. And you can see, like, you know, if, if you have someone that writes you an email when they probably shouldn't have written you an email, you know, like that person that is mad at work or school and they just 
just didn't do the rule of give yourself five minutes to breathe. They opened up their laptop, they wrote the angry email that included words that would probably get blotted out of, if you had to censor it, and they send it, and then five minutes later, so I'm sorry, I shouldn't have sent that to you. You kind of get the, the feeling when Paul's writing this letter that he needed to take five minutes. <laughs> Because his anger comes through, his passion comes through, and, and, and I think he says what he wants to say, but he also is very blunt. A couple things he says. First of all, Galatians 5, 7, he says, you were running so well. You had Jesus. You had God given himself to you totally and completely on the cross and said, I want a relationship with you. Trust, accept me, accept my death as your a, a punishment remover and a restored relationship with the living God free of charge. You had that, and, and then you traded it. You were running so well. And then something happened. You believed a lie, and it changed how you ran. Parents, I know this is uh, an extreme example, but I was trying to think of what would be the, the parental uh, connection that, that, would, that would kind of fit this. And I, I guess to use a bad example, imagine you have a 12-year-old, and you're going to leave your 12-year-old alone for the first time for a, for a four-hour afternoon. And you give them two rules. First, you have to do chores. Second, I need you to not let anyone in the house. You leave. They, they nod. You leave. You call back in an hour. How's it going? Great. Are you doing chores? Yes. Have you let anybody in? No. Great. You're going well. Things are going so well. You get home four hours later, and your home has been turned into an adult video store. You say, what happened? What happened? There's neon signs all over, and there's cars parked in our yard, and there's weird people walking through our house. Well, a, a guy came to the door. A guy came to the door. You were supposed to let anybody in. Well, he talked about the value of the dollar and entertainment uh, value, and he offered me a deal I just couldn't refuse, and I let him in, and, and this all happened. And you look at your son or daughter and say, you things are going so well. How in the world could you trade the freedom that I gave you for this? Another random, off, totally off the beaten path example would be the movie Sideways. It's a movie about wine country. Have you ever seen it? Sideways, there's this very powerful clip where one of the lead characters has this bottle of fine wine that he's saving for the perfect occasion. I mean, it's a thousands of dollar value bottle of wine. And he makes a series of choices and he burns so many bridges and he turns away from so many crucial, pivotal relationships that by the end of the movie, he has placed himself in a position where he's completely isolated and has no one and no nothing to kind of celebrate. And so he takes this, say, $2,000 bottle of wine and goes to a diner, a greasy dive. He gets a styrofoam cup and he opens the bottle. And you just have this feeling of, oh, you had something so valuable and you traded it for this. You had freedom, Paul says, and you traded it for slavery. Things were going so well. That's why Paul is so mortified. He cares about these people. Look at what he says at the beginning of the letter. This is after a brief intro. This is how he starts the letter in verse 6. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ, the free love of God. And you are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but that there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. In other words, he's like, this isn't even the same religion, guys. You're not even on the same planet. You've been led astray away from Jesus, not closer to him. Here's one of my favorite lines in the book. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. He, he just, again, he maybe should have taken five minutes. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? That's a strong way of saying something, isn't it? The word for bewitched, literally translated from the Greek language in which Paul is writing here, means to cast a magic spell. Paul's saying you are acting so strange that you are acting as if some kind of dark witch came up to you and waved a magic wand and cast a spell on you. Look at the word on the, on the lower right. Do you know where the word gospel comes from? The word gospel, hundreds of years old, comes from 
the combination good spell. It's the only good spell. It's the only message. It's the only system of reality that sets people free in a competing myriad of messages and myths that seek to control people. Paul said, you had the good spell. You had the only good spell. And you traded the freedom that comes in Jesus for, for a spell that actually controls you. And we do this too, by the way. Uh, we, uh, Christians do this too today. I was doing an event at a church with hundreds and hundreds of youth in the building and I was most excited because a lot of those youth had no concept of Jesus or church. And I, I don't know if you know that about me yet, but I just love unchurched people. I believe that that's why surprise is here. We're supposed to reach people who just aren't so churchy, who aren't just looking for the, uh, the best show in town, but actually are the people that God loves and cares about in the city. And, and, and this youth gathering that we were planning was full of these kids and they walked in and, and look, they don't, they don't look like most of us do. They, they dress pretty baggy, you know? You know the kind of teenagers I'm talking about? The guys walk in and their, head, their hats are barely over their eyes even though it's dark outside and they don't need coverage from the sun. A lot of them have big sunglasses on too. Ba pants somehow, I don't know how, you know, they would even fit on them, but they're way low and they, they look the part, okay? That's a, I get it, it's a culture, okay? Uh, it wouldn't fit me, but I, I get it. So, so they're, they're filling our church. And I'm excited. And, and they're singing. They're hearing scripture taught and preached. They're accepting the message. They're, they're talking about like our connect card kind of thing of getting involved. And I'm just excited. And as kind of they're milling about after worship and after this kind of gathering, a man who had volunteered to be there walked up to me said really loud in front of everybody, can't we get these kids to take their hats off? And it was kind of like at a dance party where someone does, says something really mean and the, the music just gets turned on. And I look at this guy, I, I, I'm speechless. Like you could watch 375 unchurched kids worshiping Jesus, many of them for the first time, and the only thing you could think about is take their hats off? Are you crazy? You have traded the freeing gospel of Jesus for a list of rules that don't matter. Jesus cares about rules and they're, they're guardrails along the road of life. There's things that we do that kind of separate us from God. I get that. Wearing hats is not one of them. Christians do this too. We create these silly little rules for each other. And I don't know why we do it. Sometimes it's just customs of things that you think show respect in a church or that you just like to see the next generation do or you like to see older people doing or whatever it is. But what we do when we do that is we act like we're under a spell. That somehow the freedom in Jesus gets trumped by this ridiculous and petty set of legalistic do's and don'ts that don't matter. Some rules make a difference that God gives us to guide our lives, but many of the things that you see getting thrown around don't. So we even do this today, and Paul says we really have to guard against this. We have to guard against ridiculous, silly rules that make Christianity look like just any other religion out there that don't help and guide us and keep us safe and keep us focused on Christ, but actually just turn people that God wants to reach away from God. Look at this verse here. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. He says this a little bit later in his letter. He says it really clearly. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Stand firm therefore. And do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. In other words, you can get saved and then go back to slavery. You can get free and find yourself forbidden from living the way that that freedom would have you live. The gospel, see, the gospel says your past doesn't have to be your future. You could have a failure. You could have a loss. You could have a, a long wake of brokenness behind you, and that doesn't have to be your future because now you have a God who declares who you are, and he declares whose you are. So your past doesn't have to be your future. You're not a slave to your past, to your tendencies, to your issues. You can find freedom within that and from that, the gospel says. And so when, when we receive that, I mean, who, who gets saved and then goes back to slavery? Well, it, it happens all the time. 
I mean, abused women go back to their abuser sometimes. Uh, addicted people can go back to their, their drug and, and as if they're under a spell. Legalistic people can stand in church and enjoy the gospel and then walk out and criticize kids for wearing hats as if they're under some weird spell. Paul is most angry in his letter at religious people who should know better, especially leaders who kind of heap these ridiculous rules on other people to try to control them to cause this enslavement. So look what he says. This is going to make you laugh, I think, in verse 12. He's talking about circumcision again, and he says, I wish those who unsettle you would castrate themselves. <laughs> What's in the Bible? How, does he, how do you really feel, Paul? There's a Christmas card Bible verse for you. Galatians 5.12, everyone, Merry Christmas. This is how Paul really feels about this. I mean, he's furious as he watches other people who should know better replace Christ with something far, far less glorious. And this is why this matters so much to Paul. Skip down to verse 13. This is the verse we're going to end with here. Paul says, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only don't use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge the flesh, for self-indulgence. But, now listen to this line, through love become, say this next word with me, slaves to one another. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought he just said he wants us free. Now he's talking about getting us slaved again. What's going on? And if you understand this, you are well on your way to getting the big picture that God has for the world. Let's take a look at this. Through love become slaves to one another. In other words, when Paul hears about the Galatian church, what he sees happening is they traded Jesus for legalism, for rigid rules that were irrelevant. And when that happened, they stopped serving each other. Otherwise, he wouldn't have to say, you know, uh, stop being selfish and, and start serving each other in love. He says, when you substitute rules for Jesus, you stop serving each other. You stop going to church and looking for ways to bless other people there. And you start thinking, what is in this for me? Are these my favorite songs? Do I need to talk to the pastor about getting a certain thing that I think would be cool on the wall? Do I, do I have my parking spot that I want? You start thinking selfishly instead of, through love, becoming slaves one another. In other words, when you trade Jesus, Paul says, you lose your gratitude for the freedom and joy that comes from knowing God through the cross, and you stop expressing that gratitude to people around you through serving. So God, the gospel is meant to create a process. It's a simple map. I love pictures. I'm a guy. Guys kind of need pictures. So the next slide kind of just spells out the process here. Uh, people individually in community are liberated by the gospel. And Paul wants to see that liberation propel the Galatian church and every church ever since into a generous community where you become a member of this radical, unique community like the Acts 2 church that they just had things in common and they treated each other with love and joy and generosity. And that generous community is so infectious and so in and contagious that it changes the world. And so Paul sees this process upset. He sees people no longer liberated by the gospel because now they don't have Jesus, they have a list of rules. And so they're no longer serving one another in a generous community. And that generous community is no longer going to change the world. You see how that works? You see why Paul's so upset? Everything in this whole, this region of the world, Paul sees in jeopardy because things are being traded for God's vision for the church. Fit people serve. That's what he's saying. Fit people serve. When we ditch the gospel, we stop serving at church and in the world. We might attend out of guilt. We might attend church as a desire to kind of consume religious programming, but we don't serve in love. So I like to think about, you know, even I as a pastor, why am I here today? Am I here to serve or be served? Jesus said, I have not come to serve. Even God became a human being. I didn't come to serve or be served. I came to serve. I had a worship leader gathering this week here at Shiloh and we, we asked a number of worship leaders from the community just to come and hang out and talk and pray. 
talking to Rob Pesky uh, on staff at Charity Lutheran Church. The question was, hey, how do you get filled up on Sundays when you're serving all Sunday? You're on stage leading the church. How do you get anything out of worship? And he said something that was just beautiful. He said, Sundays is my day to give. I see Sunday as just this amazing opportunity to just give and try to fill people up. Another worship leader across the table said, me too. I, I worship all week long. I throw my iPod in and I, I listen. I, I worship by myself. I pray. I get people around me. And then I go to church and I see it my time just to overflow. Talk to a number of people and whenever I do, it just gives me joy. New people who come to surprise and are like, hey, we're wondering if this would be a church where we could serve. And when I hear that, I hear spiritual fitness like that. That means that you have so saturated with yourself with the good news of Jesus that you are overflowing and just looking for a place to do it. Now listen, I'll be honest with you. I, I mean, if, if, I just, if I could snap my fingers and have everybody here um, serving here at Surprise and tithing and doing all the good things that church people do, I would say, great, let's do it. But you know what I'm not willing to do? I am not willing to stand up here on Sundays and try to guilt you into volunteering. I am not willing to stand up here on Sundays and try to guilt you into giving this or any church or any nonprofit a dime. Because were we to use guilt as a tactic, we're doing exactly what made Paul sick in this letter. We're substituting legalism for Jesus. So, so if I see someone like serving on a team and they're grumpy, I say, hey, let's, let's pause. Let's, let's just push pause. If someone is, is a giver and they're just grumpy about it, say, hey, let's just, let's just pause. And instead of doing something that is actually a substitute for the gospel, let's just have you sit and worship and, and give you some things, some resources to really soak up the message again because something's missing. I, I mean, these are things to do that are good, but the real key is why do we do them? Do we do things because we have to? Do we do things because we're trying to impress God or someone else? Or through love, are we so full of the love of God that through love we just become slaves to one another voluntarily? If you watch, like the volunteers at Surprise, they're just amazing people. I, I wrote some of them down and I just had too many names. I just can't go through the dozens and dozens of people here that are just overflowing. They, they just have this passion for the gospel and, and then a desire to overflow and express that passion here. And they know that the alternative to that is self-absorbed slavery for all of us. And so I'm just thankful for a church and for a team that thinks that way. So here's a, on the back of your notes, <clears throat> on the bottom of your notes, I'm going to end with this. This is kind of a for your own private evaluation. I just kind of put a couple questions to think about on this topic. Kind of a spiritual fitness related to serving and giving. Uh, just kind of a temperature gauge. You can score it however you want. A through F, S plus, S minus, smiley face, brownie face, one to five, one to a thousand, whatever. Score your own, it's just for you. But just some things to ponder as you kind of, s and uh, pastors need this too, do a little bit of a gut check. Where am I at? Is the gospel guiding me or is something else? Am I under the good spell? Is my faith based on religious rules and rituals? It can happen. We, even in a church like this, it isn't super contemporary or traditional. You know? We're going to do communion after church today. You know? And as folks come forward and receive, you can kind of do it out of a, of a ritualistic mindset and, and totally miss the gift. Jesus, do this to remember me. Is your faith kind of focused on rituals and rules, or is it a relationship? Is church a place to consume or serve? When you think of the churches, do you think get or give? Uh, do I give and serve out of guilt or obligation? Where, kind of, where, where am I at? Uh, does the opportunity to serve excite me or not? And lastly, does Jesus motivate me to give and serve in love? Is my desire to be active in my faith at church, in my family, in the community, is it motivated by the right thing, by love. Am I under the good spell? After we pray, we're going to take our offering and, you know, uh, it, it, we love, you know, to hear from you if you're new, like I said. If you'd like to get involved in any of these things, that's awesome. It's a chance to respond to kind of the message we just heard. But again, whatever you do, I just want to challenge you once again to do it for the right reasons. 
We don't want anyone here doing anything out of the altar obligation. That is not the gospel, and that's not what we want to power this place. And if you're not eager to get involved, if you're not eager to serve, or you're not eager to give, I would simply say, please don't, and instead just spend time savoring the good spell. Spend time hearing the word, soaking it in, finding your identity in God, getting with other people who can remind you of that, and then let that guide and shape the decisions you make about life and church and family. So let's pray, and then we're going to take our offering. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the good spell, the one message in the world that actually liberates human beings from the brokenness of the human condition. Heavenly Father, as we absorb it today, we pray that that one liberating message, the only message like it in the world, would power our lives that it wouldn't just be a ritual to come to church and hear a message and sing some songs and go back to a legalistic life, a purposeless life, but that it would set us free to be people of God who are born not because we decided to be born or someone decided to create us, but because we are born again through the life-saving gift of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.